Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We gather today as we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem when people rave, uh, waved palm branches and threw their coats down, welcoming him into the city uh, as the Messiah, as the promised king to come. We start with a very joyful uh, beginning of the service. There are poems in the back. If you don't have a poem or a worship uh, booklet, I invite you to come and get them now. There are also palm crosses. Please take one for someone who's not in church as well to offer to and let them know you were thinking about them on this uh, very holy day. The choir uh, following the cross and I will process through the church. You're welcome to come and process uh, along with us, uh, waving the palms. Of course, nobody has to leave their pew. Some churches begin this procession outside, but we've decided to do it inside so that those who can't process can be part of the full thing, as well as those worshiping with us via live stream. So don't be bashful. Come out and walk in the procession. Uh, claim Jesus as our King as we celebrate Palm Sunday. If you would please stand, we begin in our service booklet on page 3. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in Christ. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John. The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They shouted, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written. Don't be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand these things at first. After he was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him, and that they had done these things to him. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. If you would lift your palms as we bless the palms together, it is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us go forth in peace.
uh, who have not been here for a while, welcome home to those who have been away for a long time, and welcome to anyone visiting uh, both here in person and via live stream. We're so glad to worship uh, with you this morning. Our service today is a little changed, so we will have the readings go into the Holy Communion, and then after Communion, we will have the sermon, and then we end with the Gospel lesson of the reading of the Passion according to Mark. And we leave in silence uh, today as we begin this very Holy Week. So we begin in our service booklet, at the, I mean, we continue on the bottom of page five. Blessed be God who forgives all our sins. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah. The Lord God gave me an educated tongue to know how to respond to the weary with a word that will awaken them in the morning. God awakens my ear in the morning to listen as educated people do. The Lord God opened my ear. I didn't rebel. I didn't turn my back. Instead, I gave my body to attackers and my cheeks to beard pluckers. I didn't hide my face from insults and spitting. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I haven't been insulted. Therefore, I set my face like flint and knew I wouldn't be ashamed. The one who will declare me innocent is near. Who will argue with me? Let's stand up together. Who will bring judgment against me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me, who will condemn me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now recite parts of Psalm 31 responsibly, whole verse by whole verse. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I am depressed. My vision fails because of my grief, as do my spirit and my body. My life is consumed with sadness. My ears are consumed with groaning. Strength fails me because of my suffering. My bones dry up. I'm a joke to all my enemies, still worse to my neighbors. I scare my friends, and whoever sees me in the street runs away. I am forgotten like I am dead, completely out of mind. I am like a piece of pottery destroyed. Yes, I've heard all the gossiping, terror all around. So many gang up together against me. They plan to take my life. But, but me, I trust you, Lord. I affirm you are my God. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. reading from Philippians. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I am a Pharisee. 
With respect to devotion to the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets, but I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have lost everything for him. But what I lost I think of as sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. In Christ, I have a righteousness that is not my own, and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. The righteousness that I have comes from knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death, so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. The word of the Lord. Please stand for kneel for the prayer. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Anne, our bishop, Vincent, our priest, Clark, our postulant, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. In the Diocese of Ohio, for St. Peter's Church Lakewood, and for the North Central Missionary, St. Paul's Church Bellevue, St. Andrew's Church Elyria, St. Paul's Church Fremont, Christ Church Huron, and Church of the Redeemer Lorraine. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and the infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, especially remembering Teddy, Shirley, John, Megan, Kyle, Spencer, Ella Jane, Joseph, Martha, Joseph, Pamela, Boots, Fred, Marilyn, Anthony, David, Elaine, Gil, Larry, Dale, Mary, Erica, Maxine, Dave, Linda, Cole, Wendy, Corky, Frank, Diane, John, and Bill. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, especially remembering Betty, Joanne, Christopher, Anne, Brian, Donald, Thomas, Chris, Edward, and Gloria. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of saints, 
let us commend ourselves and one another and all our love to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord our God. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Please be seated. So to be sure, um, our ushers can confirm with me, the passion readings were given out with the bulletins. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I need, a, I need one, please. <laughs> so in our bulletin, you can see today, uh, we have birthdays today or this week. Uh, we have Grace and Carol. Are there other birthdays in the congregation or loved ones today or this week? Yes? Your birthday. Susan's birthday. Yes? Harold? Yes? Adeline? Wonderful. You see Adeline is here and she made the bold gesture uh, to donate her hair uh, for St. Fadric for, um, uh, for children with cancer. Is that right? And so her mom did look at it. Thank you, Adeline. That's a good example to us of how to give of ourselves for, for those who are in need. So we pray for your birthday. And who else? Yes. Sherry, yes? You! Happy birthday! And when is your birthday? Friday. Wonderful. Anyone else? Yes? Kathy? Russ? Okay, for those mentioned, those we may be forgetting, let us pray the prayer together on page 11. O oh God, So we, we pray for the family and particularly for Richard and Rosemary and their grief. And we grieve with you. So as I said, uh, today's service is a bit different in order. Uh, we will go uh, directly into Holy Communion now. And then we will have the reading. Um, and we'll have the sermon and end with the reading of the Passion 
For those reading parts in the Passion, the microphone will be in the middle of the church. I ask that you please go up to the microphone to read. Don't say your voice is loud enough because it's not loud enough for those who are worshiping with us via live stream. So um, I ask you please to just make your way ahead of time to the microphone. Um, if you're reading, uh, you could try to scoot in on this side or be able to access uh, directly. Again, for those of you uh, visiting, if, if you look on page 22 for the rest of the week, our Holy Week services, um, you might want to take this home, not only those who are visiting, but all of you, our members. So our Thursday night service for Bombay Thursday is 7.30. After that, we keep watch with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane until midnight. You can sign up for that if you like here. Uh, we will worship together at noon uh, with our church family, St. Peter's down the street, and then at night on Good Friday here again at 7.30. Easter Sunday we have one service at the same time at 10.30. There is a vigil at the cathedral downtown, our cathedral where our bishop and several other dioceses will worship together. And we have two uh, people being baptized and confirmed by our bishop, so Aaron and Domenico, so if you're able to join us at the vigil at 8 p.m., please do so. Uh, also, you can see that the alt uh, if you would like to leave flowers in honor or dedication of somebody, the sign-up is over here. Today is the last day to do so. If there's somebody that you would like to be remembered or honored with Easter flowers, and there is a, a donation box there as well. And please take time to read the rest of the announcements that are in the bulletin. Um, when we begin Easter season, uh, we, will, we will continue with our watching of the, season, uh, the series Chosen, which is a, a drama series of Jesus' life, and we have conversations about it. It's really great. We will do season two beginning April 11th. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask, ask me. Please know all are welcome here to receive Holy Communion at God's table. Uh, we come forward to receive communion at the altar rail. Our tradition is to kneel or stand. If it's easier for you for me to bring communion to you, just let an usher know, and I'm happy to do so. Um, we receive bread and wine that have been consecrated. You could either uh, dip the bread in the small cup or drink from the large cup. Or just receive the bread alone. We believe you participate fully in the Blessed Sacrament in one or both forms. Uh, but just know that all are welcome here at God's table. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for our sins he was lifted up high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ is Lord. Amen. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
of God for you, the people of God. Take the remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may be seated. For those of you who may not wish to receive sacramentally and those of you who are worshiping with us via live stream, Dan will now lead us in the spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you, and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Amen.
Whereas Luke likes to tell us that such and so was the Roman governor and such and so was the high priest at the time, Mark just says, Jesus went here and did that. So when Mark does include little details like this, it's his way of yelling at us, this is important, pay attention. But in order to figure out what Mark might be telling us, we first have to parse out just what's going on with the naked young man. One of the most popular theories is that this young man was sleeping in a house nearby, heard the commotion, threw a sheet around himself, and went out to see what was going on. I don't think this is very likely for two reasons. First, this hinges on interpreting the very vague term that gets translated linen cloth as a sheet. It could really mean anything from that to a burial shroud to a garment that was completely normal to wear. Second, this young man was following Jesus. Some translations actually will say that he is a disciple. And that's not too far off. Now that doesn't sound like someone who just rushed outside to see what the hubbub was. If you want to hear some other theories that, despite being whimsical and fun, aren't relevant to this sermon, do come find me anytime. Unfortunately, there's no coffee hour today, but any other time, please come talk to me. I would love nothing more than that. What I think is most likely is that this story is actually much more straightforward than that. If we understand what the young man is wearing as an article of clothing in itself, we can zero in on the meaning much more quickly. Now I'm going to call it a cloak, because that's what scholars call it, but it's not what we picture when we think of a cloak. This would be a seamless rectangle of cloth, very carefully arranged around the body without any fastenings. And this could be worn either with or without a tunic underneath. Now, if you look in our windows, you might be able to see some examples of this. Now, Mark goes out of his way to tell us that he didn't have a tunic underneath, which becomes important later. Now, because of how this cloak was worn, it took a lot of effort to keep it on. There's no fastenings. That also means that it was something that only people who didn't have to do manual labor would wear. Now, there's actually a little fun, surprising trope in ancient literature of people losing their cloaks. Sometimes, like in this story, people grab them, and sometimes you lose it in a lawsuit or as punishment for a crime. You might remember another Bible story where someone slips out of his clothes and runs away naked. Does anyone know off the top of their head? It's Joseph in Genesis running away from Potiphar's wife. She grabs him and he runs away naked. All right. So we can think of this young man as someone fairly affluent who was interested in Jesus and had been with him during his last days in Jerusalem. And he even sticks with Jesus after the crowd appears right up until the authorities seize him. So now that we have all the historical stuff out of the way, what can we learn from the naked young man? I believe he's here to dramatize the cowardly flight of the disciples, and of Peter in particular. Though the disciples do often fail as a collective, Mark focalizes much of their blundering through Peter. He's the one who rebukes Jesus for predicting his death and receives a hearty rebuke in return, getting called Satan. And he babbles about building shelters during the transfiguration. Even after the resurrection, the angel in the empty tomb tells the women to report what they've seen to his disciples and Peter. He is the only disciple whom the angel specifically names, as though he is the representative of all the disciples. And even the Passion Place pays close attention to him. First, he insists that he'll never leave Jesus and he'll even die for him. Then he, James, and John fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus wakes them all, he speaks specifically to Peter. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Almost immediately after that, the crowd arrives to arrest Jesus, and all the disciples flee, proving that their willing spirits are not strong enough to overcome their weak flesh. 
Peter then follows the arresting party to the courtyard where he waits with the guards and servants. As with his insistence on loyalty, his willing spirit shows through here since he still cares enough about Jesus to monitor the outcome of the trial. And then finally, his weak flesh gives in when he denies Jesus three times. Nakedness for the young man and for Peter symbolizes not only shame, but also the exposure of one's true nature. Peter's arc in Mark 14 begins with him asserting his allegiance to Jesus, but by the end he has shown the truth of what Jesus said in Gethsemane. When he runs away from the commotion, his willing spirit is stripped away, leaving his, revealing his weak flesh. This finally culminates in his denial, after which he realizes that all his aspirations to martyrdom were an illusion, and he weeps bitterly at this discovery. Peter is tragically human, which is why I like him so much. He reaches so high and falls so far. He is the first to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, and then is immediately called Satan because he thinks that he gets to rebuke Jesus. But Peter isn't just the representative of the other disciples, but also the audience. Whenever we read stories from the Bible, it's only natural to ask ourselves with whom we identify. And if we're being honest, it is almost never Jesus. We are Peter when he denies Jesus. We are the crowd who shouts, crucify him. We are the young man who flees naked. No matter how many times we insist that we'll do the right thing, those are only words. Words that are so easily stripped away by the right temptation or the right fear. Before God, though, we stand exposed. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, all the disciples would desert him, and that Peter would deny him. God knows how we'll fail, too. But if we never see it, how can we ever change? How can we ever let God in to transform us? If the disciples had never been in a position that exposed their cowardice, would they have still become the saints we know? The saints in our windows, the saints who have churches named after them all around the world. Peter denied Jesus, but he was still the rock upon which the church was built. Exposure only needs to be feared if you're being bared to danger. But we are made vulnerable to love. We ought not run from it. Jesus sees every single hope and fear and foible that makes you, you. And he still died for you. There must be something in you that's worth dying for. He died for Peter and the crowd and the person who had the misfortune of going down in history as the naked young man. On the surface, this man is not one we should want to emulate. He abandoned Jesus when the going got rough. But in doing so, he reminded us how we ought to approach God, naked and weak, aware of our failures and eager to be sanctified, sanctified by the blood of Christ, which is nothing less than the total, unrelenting, self-giving love of God. Amen.
not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of a very costly ointment of nard, nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the anointment wasted this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, the money given to the poor. And he scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and beg preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely, not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve. One who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated, and said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, 
If it were possible, the, this hour might pass from him. But he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and leave him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come up with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were abandoned? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need of witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Arise. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You were also with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you were talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, 
the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone who they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call king of the Jews? They shouted back. Crucify him. Pilate asked them. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemo sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry, 
and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When the evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. 